Hi everyone, this is the seventh and hopefully, or unfortunately, the final video in the Formula Student series. Today we're going to be having a look at fault finding and debugging, trying to work out why the display board that we made in the previous video doesn't work, and hopefully by the end we'll have a fully finished project. Let's get started. So the first thing I want to do is just power up the board, which with this board is probably easiest by just plugging in USB. Unfortunately, the USB cable I used to test it is plugged into my microphone now, so I need to get another one. Right, here we go, USB in. And you can see we've got a few interesting things going on. So I'll just turn this light off. Now you can see the digits a bit nicer. I'm noticing three things immediately. The first is that it's not counting, so we need to work out why that is. The second is that it's got a value of 8, not 0. And the third is that that segment's not on. I think I'm going to start by thinking about this 8, which I don't really care about what value it has when it turns on, because I should hopefully, there we go, be able to press reset and it all turns back to 0. Probably the most concerning issue is the fact that it's not counting up. That final segment uh, we can also look at later. So as this is a dynamic thing that we're looking at, and the oscilloscope is probably the best tool, so I'm going to turn on my oscilloscope, and I'm also going to try and get a little bit more light. There we go. Hopefully you can still make out stuff. Right, so what I've done is I've set my phone up recording the oscilloscope, and I've got the camera on the decimal clock. Hopefully you'll be able to see what I'm probing, and what the oscilloscope then shows. So the first thing I want to probe is the output of the oscillator. But unfortunately I can't get to that because it'll be on the back side of the board and I don't really want to move this. So I'm going to find the input pin of the 4020, which is that chip, and that will be connected to the 4 MHz output. So it's pin 10, which is one up from the bottom right pin. So it should be that one. The first thing I want to do is ground my probe, which for now I'm just going to hold it onto the USB connector here. Then if I touch this onto that pin, hmm, we've got no output from the oscillator. So now we have to think about why that might be. I'm thinking, the first thing that jumps to my head is the enable pin, which I think I left floating. So what we can do is we can get a jumper wire like this, and if we look at the back of the board, the oscillator here has four pins. There'll be um, 5 volt ground output and enable. So we just need to find which one is enable and then we can try connecting it to 5 volts, connecting it to ground and seeing if our number changes when we flip this back over. So this bottom left pin should be the enable pin and 5 volts is on the back side of this board so if I connect those together for a little bit and then take them apart, let's see if the numbers changed. It has not. Interesting. So, tell you what, I'll put the scope probe on the output pin of the oscillator, which is here. Let's just check that it's getting power to it. So, there you can see we've got 5 volts. I've got, I've got the oscilloscope set to 5 volts per division. I'll just change that to 2 volts so it's a bit clearer. There we go. The noise is just the probe not making a very good contact. So there we've got 5 volts. This one should be ground, and the enable pin, the enable pin is 5 volts, so maybe let's try tying it low instead. So that would be connecting it to this pin. Sorry if it's a bit dark on the camera. I'll bring a bit more light in. There we go, hopefully that's a bit clearer. So now I need to use all three of my hands so that I can probe the output while joining these together. What I'm actually going to do it's something I've been doing quite a bit recently. For things like this, I need to short those two pins together. I can use my tweezers. If it's not a like high frequency signal or something, it doesn't really matter. And high voltage, of course. So that's the probe on the output. And if I connect that to ground, the output still doesn't change. So neither of them seem to really do anything. So what I'm going to do now is just quickly Google the oscillator I'm using and make sure I've got the correct pin out. Right, so it looks like the corner that isn't rounded on the front side marks the enable pin or 
the not connected pin depending on what type of oscillator you've got. So for us, that's the not pointy corner. That's the pointy corner. So then flipping it over, that would correlate to this pin down here, which is the pin we were just fiddling with. So then going right from that should be 5 volts, going up from that should be ground. So let's just double check that. Going right from that is 5 volts, going up from that is ground. So that's all as it should be. But we're still not getting any output. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the 4020 chip, because it might be that that's doing something to the oscillator output. Once that's removed, then the oscillator output will be unloaded. So to remove that, some people just grab them and pull them, but I'm always a bit worried that you're going to bend pins doing that, so normally I try and come in with something like a little flathead screwdriver. So in this case it's quite a big flathead screwdriver, but it should be fine. Come in there. And then now I've freed up the space to put in these. These are nice because from one side you can lift up the other side. There we go. That's the chip out. So now the output of the oscillator should just be floating. Well, not loaded down I mean, so that means that when we turn it on, the oscillator should now have an output. Let's probe that pin again. Still nothing. It's just hovering at a weird voltage. I think the next thing I'm going to try is removing the oscillator and feeding in a signal so then I can test the rest of the board and then also once the oscillator's out I can test it on its own with nothing else that could potentially be messing it up. There we go. And this is a nice example of what happens if you're impatient and you just pull. Hopefully you can see on the leg closest to the camera, what I've done is I've pulled the plated through hole out of the board, which is never a great thing to do. But plated through holes make desoldering a lot harder. So now let's try this oscillator just on its own and see what happens. Right, so I've got my own external power. So we're going to have ground up here. 5 volts is coming in down here. I've got to make sure that they don't short out on the the shell of the oscillator. There we go. And then the next thing to do is connect the probe to the output. So I'm going to put my little hook back on the probe. And the output should be this pin. Now I'll just turn the power on. And we're getting nothing. Interesting. Again, let's try playing around with that enable pin. So if I get that little piece of jumper wire back, I'm going to try first connecting the enable pin high. Nothing. And then now connecting the enable pin low. Nothing. It seems like we may have a dead oscillator on our hands. I do remember one of my oscillators being broken. Luckily I do have some spares, but not 4 MHz, so I might have to try and acquire one. This one is a 25 MHz oscillator. Let's connect all the same pins and see, see what happens. It's drawing some current, which is always a good sign. And there we go, we get a 25 MHz output. So as I say, it appears this 4 MHz one is dead, which is quite annoying actually. Next let's try just feeding in a signal into the board. So I'll plug this back in. I need to pop back in the 4020 as well. Press the reset button to take it back to zero. Now I can get a TTL output from my function generator and touch that to the pins where the oscillator's output should be. So right now it's set to 1 MHz and it should just be touching it on these two pins. So let's try that. Nothing. Let's put the probe on this output. There you can see the 1 MHz output on the oscilloscope, but if I touch it to here we get nothing. The next thing I'm going to try is removing the AND gate, which is used, the output of the AND gate is something, is what triggers the counters. Now I can connect my 
signal from the function generator straight into the first 4026 and see if they count up based on that. And I'm going to slow it down to 100 hertz. On the 4026, pin 1 is the input, so it should just be as simple as connecting that. There you go, it's counting. Now the third digit's not counting up, but at the moment I don't really care about that. We can make that one count up. That one is not counting. There's some more counting. Let's see if it goes to the final digit. Way nice. So now we've discovered another issue, which is something to do with this one, which is probably a simple fix compared to the fact that the oscillator is broken. And also it appears that this counting reset circuitry doesn't work properly. So I think the next thing I'm going to look at is the reset circuitry, try and work out why that's not working. The oscillator, I can just order another one. So the first thing I'm going to do is to get two jumper wires and put them into the holes of where the pins of the oscillator should go. That will make it very easy to feed in a, an external signal. This one needs a bit of heating to get the solder to move out the hole. Don't solder while things are turned on, it's a bad idea. Let's test the reset button for all the digits. That works nicely. It's always good when there's something that works on your board. Even if the whole thing is completely broken like this, you just get a little bit of satisfaction from, oh, this button works. Now what I'm going to do is probe various different points and consider the signal we're expecting and see what we're actually getting. So I've set the fake oscillator to 10 kilohertz for now. So if I touch my probe to that pin and then adjust the oscilloscope slightly, there we go. That's our 10 kilohertz input. So now it should be getting divided on various outputs of the 4020. So looking at the schematic, the pins we're interested in are 12, 14, and 3. They should all be various divisions of the 10 kilohertz input signal. So pin 3, we can count from the top left going down. 1, 2, 3. Let's see what that has on it. Oh, that's nice and slow. Next, let's have a look at pin 12. So that'll be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That has a 20 hertz square wave on it. And then pin 14 should then be divided twice more. So we're expecting a 5 hertz wave. Let's see what we get. Oh, it's a bit too hard, it's a bit too slow for the scope to see. But I imagine it's probably that. Let's speed everything up. There we go. So now I'm feeding in 1 megahertz. Pin 3 is at about 70 hertz. Then pin 12. So now pin 12 is at 2 kilohertz, which means that pin 14 should be at 1 kilohertz because it's divided once more. There we go. Now the outputs of these should feed into pins 1, 2 and 13 on the first AND gate inside the AND gate chip, which is this one. Pin 1 should be the 2 kilohertz signal. Pin 2 should be the 1 kilohertz signal. And then pin 13, which is over here, should be the slow signal that was like 70 hertz or something. Yes, so that's what we want. Then the AND output of that should be something a bit weird. And the AND output is pin 12. Yep, that looks weird. That should then feed into pin 3, which is the input of the next AND gate. Yes. Along with pins 4 and 5, which are connected to two of the outputs on the next counter. So pin 4 and pin 5. They both look like they're at some kind of frequency, which is nice. And then the output of that AND gate, that's the crucial one. That's the reset for all the rest. That's pin 6. 
So one, two, three, four, five, six. And I think this might be where our problem is. The output goes high, which then feeds back and resets the other two chips and immediately takes the output low again. And that pulse might be too narrow for the 4026s to count. Let's zoom in and see how narrow it is on the scope. I'm going to change to normal triggering to stop it jittering around. And it's about 10 nanoseconds wide, that pulse, which probably isn't enough for the 4026 to trigger. This is an example of what would often be referred to as shit circuit design, but I think a bodge wire or two might be able to fix it. The slowest input into this AND gate will go high, and then something else will go high, which will then reset it and they'll all go low. So that slowest input into the AND gate should have an on time that's more than 10 nanoseconds. So let's find the slowest input, and for that I'm going to put the oscilloscope into roll mode, which is good for viewing slow signals. Well that one looks fast. That one's quite fast. That one's slower. That one's very slow. And then this is our pulse, which you can't even see. So this slow one should be at the same frequency as the pulse. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try feeding that to the input of our 4026. So probably the easiest way to do that is to cut the trace that goes to the output that we don't want, making sure that we're only cutting it to the 4026. We don't want to cut it. We still need that, that pulse to reset these two chips. And then we're going to bring this, which is pin 5, I think. Yes, pin 5. We're going to bring that to the input of the 4026 with a thin piece of wire. I've decided I'm actually going to test this first. So the way of doing that is to remove this 4026 and then bend up the input pin so that it's no longer in the socket. Then I can connect it to whatever I want. So that's just this first pin. I'm just going to bend it out. I don't have to be too careful because I have a lot of these chips. Pop that in. And now as a bit of a test, I can touch, touch it with this screwdriver while my finger's on it. And it should count up at 50 hertz if the amplitude of the voltage on my body is high enough, which it should be. There you go. So you'll find that this is counting up in steps of 200 milliseconds. Now let's try connecting this to our pin 5 and see if anything happens. It's quite easy to think it's working because when I touch it, it's picking up the voltage on my body. That's working nicely. The question is whether that is actually at the correct speed. So the way I'm going to test this is that we should be dividing by 675 if our circuitry is working correctly. So I'm going to feed in 675 kilohertz and we should have a 1 kilohertz output. It seems to me like that's not happening. So this should be about 675 kilohertz going in. But you'll see if I connect to the output to here, that's not a kilohertz. That's counting quite slow. And I imagine the reason for that is that this very narrow output pulse that's coming from the AND gate is resetting one of these counters, probably this one because it's a lot faster, and not that one. And that's making weird things happen. Let's check that theory. So the output pulse that should reset everything is here. I'm going to have to turn the oscilloscope out of roll mode. 20 nanoseconds per division should be good for visualizing the pulse. I need to put it in normal mode as well. There we go. So you can see the pulse on the screen and now that seems to be triggering sort of a bit faster than 1 hertz. So now let's have a look at some of the outputs of the counter chips and see whether they are also resetting at that kind of speed. So the slowest output of this counter is going to be on pin 3. 1, 2, 3. That's a bit too fast to tell. Although we could probably tell if we zoomed out slightly. 
Try and see if it's doing anything weird. Yeah, can you see those little narrow pulses? That to me suggests that this chip is getting reset. Because it's getting reset as this is high, it gets reset and that brings it back low. Now let's have a look at the slowest output of the next counter, which is probably going to be too slow. So actually I'm going to look at the slowest output we care about, which is on pin 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Put the probe there. Let's see what kind of frequency we're looking at. I'm going to put back in roll mode for this one. And that doesn't seem to be showing any evidence of getting reset, which again is probably because this chip is not fast enough for the width of that pulse. What I've done now is I've swapped the high speed 4020 that I got for a much slower one. And now we're having a lot more success. You can see on the oscilloscope screen, hopefully, that we're getting an output pulse at the correct frequency. And it is actually a pulse that the 4026 can, can understand. The problem now is that for some reason there's two pulses. So I'm going to probe the inputs to the, to the two AND gates. So that'll be five inputs total. And we're going to see if we can figure out why that is. Now that looks interesting. That's a square wave with a bit of a weird erratic pulse happening sometimes. So that, that suggests to me now that maybe one of the chips isn't fully resetting and it requires two pulses. Let's have a look at a slow output on the 4024. It is this one that's looking a bit suspect to me. So I think what I might try, which is really janky, is just putting a cap across that line. So that will basically act like a low pass filter and get rid of that little pulse. Let's try first with a 10 nanofarad capacitor. And I'm going to leave the scope probe on the pin we're interested in, which is the output of the AND gate that resets the chips. And that is going to be pin 1 of the 4026 I just removed. So I should be able to just shove the probe in here. There we go. You can see our weird double pulses. And now I'm going to try a cap between here and here. Still seeing double. Let's try a slightly higher value. This is now 100 nano. Still not doing anything. This is now 1 microfarad. I don't really want to have to go any higher than this. And it's still doing it. Hmm. Let's see if that 1 mic cap does anything to the, to the output of that counter. So that's the one with the weird erratic pulse. And then if I connect my one microfarad to ground, it does smooth it and it does get rid of that weird pulse. But the weird pulse is still on the main output. Let's try just smoothing the main output, which is probably going to make this timer inaccurate. Because it'll add in a small amount of delay into the reset. So every time, instead of it reaching 675 and then resetting, it'll reach 675, then the cap will add in a little bit more delay, so it might divide by 680, which then means it'll be slightly slow, which is a shame, so there's probably a nicer fix, but just for now we're going to try that. Yeah, the problem is both the pulses are the same amplitude and the same width, so we can't really remove one without removing the other. Now this is a stage where you may find yourself having a very strong desire to just give up. But don't do that because it's sad. What I'm thinking now is basically the way this reset circuitry works. It works well if you've got one timer chip feeding the AND gate. Because the output of the AND gate will stay high until that timer chip's reset. The problem with this is that there's two timer chips. So the output will stay high until one of them's reset, and then the other one won't, or it might do something weird. So what I'm thinking is, I'm going to see if I can find any oscillators, seeing as we need a new one anyway, that are at the right frequency that we can just ignore this chip and just use the outputs from the 4020. Because right now, it looks like on the schematic, we're already dividing by 128 in here before we even use any of the outputs. So if we got an oscillator that was already 100 times slower, we might be able to get away with just using one chip. 
So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have a look online and see what I can find. Right, so it's been a few days and the first thing is the oscillator. So what I've ended up doing is I've bought a 1 megahertz oscillator. That was the slowest I could find that was still in this footprint. And I've also come up with a way that we can do the frequency division that will actually work. And what that is, is that at the moment we've got, I've removed the, the chirps, but at the moment the signal comes from the 4 megahertz oscillator, then it gets divided by 2 a whole load of times in the 4020 until we can't half it anymore. Then using a combination of the slowest outputs of the 4020 and the 4024 that follows it, we then divide by 4, 600 and 675. But that means that the divide by n circuitry that's doing the six, 675 division is using a combination of these two counters, which is where our problem, I, I believe, is coming from. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the signal in, divide by 675 as early as possible, or almost as early as possible as you'll see, then feed the output from that, which will be the little narrow pulse, feed that into the 4024 to then divide it down further. So I did some notes here which you probably won't be able to read because of my handwriting, but the period that we want on the least significant digit is a millionth of a day, because we've got milli days, micro days, this is one micro day. And one micro day is 86.4 milliseconds. The clock period is, because it's a one megahertz clock, it's one millionth of a second, so it's got a one microsecond period. And that's quite interesting because what that means is we need 86,400 clock cycles of the oscillator to increment the least significant digit on our counter by one. And that's interesting because that's the number of seconds in a day. So basically, the oscillator produces an output with a period of one millionth of a second, and we want one millionth of a day. So it works quite nicely. Then looking at the prime factors of 86,400, which is what we want to divide by, it's 2 to the power of 7, 3 to the 3, and 5 to the 2. So if we look at, if we get rid of the ones that aren't powers of 2, because dividing by 2 is very easy, it's 675, which is what we had before. Because we've only changed from a 4 megahertz oscillator to a 1 megahertz, we've just removed two powers of 2 that we need to divide by. Looking at 675 in binary, as I did in FS0 video, we can see these are the particular divisions on the output of the ripple counter that we're going to be wanting to and together for our reset signal. And then what we're also going to do is we're going to make it so that the slowest signal, which would be the most significant bit of our 675, we want that to be the slowest signal on the 4020, just because the slower we're running at, the better. And that means we're going to end up anding these pins together, Q14, 12, 10, 6 and 5, and all of those together in the AND chip we've already got. Feed it back, and then all we need to do is divide by 2, two more times. 2 to the power of 2 is 4. So basically, we're going to have our clock signal coming in, and all of those together, that will then divide the signal by 675. It's also getting divided by 2 to the power of 5, which is 32, for these, because you can see the lowest one is Q5, that's why it's 2 to the 5. And that's because, as I say, we've made this division by 675 as slow as possible. And the 4020 doesn't give you, I think, divisions by 4, 8 and 16, maybe, or maybe just 4 and 8. Then we just feed that narrow pulse into the 4024, and all that has to do is give us a division by 4. And that will also, because we've divided by 2 multiple times, that will give a nice square wave. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to build all that up on a breadboard and see whether it works in theory. That's what you should always do, and what I was too cocky and I thought I could get away with not doing, is testing a circuit before you put it on a PCB and order it. Of course that's not always possible, but when it is like this, you definitely should. Right, so I've made my breadboard circuit and it does all work correctly, which is really nice. So I can show you what I've done. I've tried to colour code things somewhat nicely. So hopefully you can make out something from this side view. I've got red as 5 volt, black as ground. Then orange is our signal coming in. So you can see here it's connected to the function generator. That's sending out 1 megahertz. That then goes into the chip on the left, which is the 4020. We then have three of the five outputs that we need, the three fastest, head over to the AND gate, where they're then ANDed together, 
and the output of that is the first of the yellow lines. So the blue lines are the three fastest. Yellow is then the three slower ones going into the next AND gate because it's it, we want a five input AND gate basically but what we're doing is we're using a three input AND gate and then sending the output into another three input AND gate so overall we get five inputs. The yellow, the leftmost yellow is the output from the first AND gate and then the other two yellows come over to here which are the slowest outputs from the 4020. Then the overall output from our AND gate which is this white wire comes over and resets the 4020. The pulse that it that resets the 4020 is very narrow because it's the it's the high speed 4020 that I got. So that's actually too narrow to trigger the 4024. So instead what we do is we take the slowest input which basically is let's say we're resetting at 100 Hz, the slowest input might be at 80 Hz. So it goes high and then before it would normally go low, it gets reset and brought low. So I can show you on the scope in a minute, but that just gives a nice long on time and off time so that the 4024 can then divide it. I think my maths is slightly wrong because I have to divide by 8 instead of 4 in the 4024 but I don't really care because it's working really nicely. So let's check out a few waveforms with this wire which is connected to my scope probe. First of all let's check the input from our function generator which if I adjust the time divisions you can see is a 1 megahertz input period 1 microsecond. And the first thing we want to do is divide that by 2 a few times within the 4020 just to take it down to a more manageable frequency. So the fastest output from the 4020 is should be this one. There we've got 31 kilohertz. And the reason it's doing that weird pulsing thing is because it's sometimes getting reset and that's upsetting the triggering on the scope. Then we get the other outputs from the 4020. So you've got the other two blues and the two yellows and them all together. And then this white is our output, which is the reset signal. If we have a look at that, you can see a very thin, narrow pulse on the scope. And if I zoom in, you can see it's quite narrow. So this is with 20 microseconds per division. I've got very poor grounding, so that's why it looks so weird. But it looks like it's about a 20 nanosecond pulse width, which unfortunately is too narrow for the 4024 to detect. So instead what we do is, if I zoom back out, you'll see the frequency of this is, if I'm just going to zoom until the point where I can just about see two pulses, there we go. And now if I move the probe to the slowest input of the AND gate, you can see that has the same period because we've got three high points on the, on the oscilloscope screen. Instead of having a 20 nanosecond on time, we've got a lot more than that, which means the 4024 can actually detect it. So now you can see this green wire, which is the one I'm looking at now, goes over to the input of the 4024 there we've got the same signal and now if I connect to this, this brown is our output then there it looks like we've got some kind of slow square wave and as I say because you can feed in any duty cycle into a divide by two chip and once you've divided it by two it becomes a beautiful square wave 50-50 on off which is what we have here and the best part period 86.6 milliseconds. Let's have a quick look at my maths I did before. You can see at the top input period 86.4 milliseconds. Now I imagine that little bit of error is probably due to the function generator that I'm using it just has an analog knob to control the frequency. So it's whether I set it so the accuracy of the output depends on how well I position this knob. I do have a digital one, but it's a, got a noisy fan, so I can't really use it while recording. But overall, I take this as a big win. And now, I think we could feed the output of this breadboard circuit into the decimal clock and see what happens. So it wants to go into this pin, and there we go. It's counting up. Isn't that nice? Again, it's reminding us of the slight issue that this digit doesn't count up and this digit's missing a segment. But now that we've got a nice input, I think we can probably have a look at fixing those. My one megahertz oscillator is on its way, and if we fix these other two issues quickly, then we could probably try and have a look at how to bodge a circuit board so that we can get this circuit from our breadboard onto here. I'm hoping I can put everything on the back of the board so that you can't tell that I've completely messed up the circuit. Just because I was interested, I thought I would feed in a signal from my function generator and see how fast these 4026 chips can cope with. So right now, I'm sending in 
a 100 hertz signal and it's counting up fine. I'm going to keep increasing it until something stops working. Looks like it can cope with a 1 kilohertz input, up to the point where it gets quite hard to tell. But I imagine if the frequency goes too high, it will just freeze on a digit. So let's try if I change range. That's 1 kilohertz, 2 kilohertz. Seems happy still. Let's try 100. 1 meg. I think this is probably an experiment that's going to be a lot more interesting once we've got this digit working. So let's have a look at that now with the oscilloscope. So here I'm looking at our clock input, which I'm going to zoom in on slightly because everything else is going to be slower than that. Then this is the input to our second 4026, which should be divided by 10 and is now quite slow. So let's see if this is then getting divided by 10 again and fed into the next one, as it should be. Looks like it is. I'm going to put this in roll mode because this 4026 is running at quite a low frequency. There we go in roll mode and we can see the clock input of the 4026 is doing what it should be. It's just not counting up for some reason. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have a look at the pinout for the 4026 and have a look at where I'd find the pins of interest, like the reset pin, maybe power, although the LED display is on. So pins 2, 3, 4 and 15 all look like they're interesting. Uh, I think 15 is the reset and 2, 3 and 4 are all various different enables and things like that. So let's have a look with our probe. And what we can do is we can just compare them against one of the 4026s that does work. So I don't actually need to know what the pins do. So that one's ground, a little bit noisy. That's the same as this working one. This one's high. It's high on this one. Pin 4 is high. Pin 4 is high on this one. And then finally we've got the reset pin, which is low on this one and low on that one. Hmm. Maybe we've just got a dodgy 4026, which for me is a very easy fix because I can just pull it out and swap it with one of my many others. Right, so here's another 4026. Let's see if that does anything. Huh? Success! It was just a dodgy chip. Ah, oh, isn't that brilliant? I'm going to adjust the viewing angle slightly and we can go back to that experiment I was trying earlier, see how fast they can count up. Because if they can count really fast, you could use it to make a high precision timer, you could use it to make a frequency counter, anything like that. I imagine they're probably good up to maybe one meg. That seems to be the frequency limit of most of these 4000 series chips that I have. Right, there we go. I've propped it up nicely and I've adjusted the exposure so you should be able to make out the, what the digits are showing. The reset button we can test again as well. So it should be if I hold it, they're all zero, and then just as it ticks over to midnight, let go and it starts counting up. We're at 100 hertz input at the moment, let's try 1 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, 1 megahertz. And it does look like it can actually cope with a 1 megahertz input, which is absolutely crazy. And this now shows all our digits are working, except that segment on that digit, which is fine. We're going to have a look at that next. I should have put something in to pause it, because all I can do is reset. But it's crazy to think that these digits are actually updating that fast. I'll try 2 MHz, which is the highest frequency that this function generator can do. And it can cope with that. Very cool. Let's see, I think probably the best that will show up on the video is something closer to maybe 10 hertz like this. And once again, I can press the reset button and set them all to zero, except the day counter, because this circuit's designed so that if it has a bit of drift, you can reset it without having to lose your day count. So I'm going to leave it propped up like this, and now I'm going to have a go at finding out why this segment on the final digit's not on. That's our only problem now. So that's segment C which isn't on, which correlates to pin 13 on the 4026. So if we count backwards, 16, 15, 14, 13. So it should be high at the minute, but it's not. And if we just check on the other ones, yeah, you can see they've got a bit of voltage when they're driving the LED. And this one doesn't. So the first thing I'm going to try, because it's the easiest thing to try, is once again swapping it for a different 4026. Now don't worry, this isn't going to happen with your project where you buy chips. The reason this is happening is because these chips are all 
very old and they're from a school where students would probably break the chips and then put them back in the drawer. So I would not worry about buying broken chips because that never really happens. Let's see how this one goes. There we go, that was our problem. Which is a bit annoying because I don't get to do much fault finding. But that should all be working now. I'll send in a fast signal again and have a check. Oh interesting, it looks like this one's not counting now. Let's try slowing it down. Yeah, now we've got one that's not counting. Luckily I just got two out, so we can try again. What I'm going to try this time as well is unplugging it and then putting the chip in. Because although these older chips are very tolerant, you can sometimes damage chips by connecting them wrong. Oh, I think I just put back in the broken one. Uh, uh. Hmm. I'm going to set this fast again, and then I'm going to probe the input to this chip. Yep, that's counting up all right. Let's just check all of the other inputs. So it should be low, high, high on this side. Low, high, high. And then reset should be low, which is low. Oh, interesting. When I touched it with the probe, it started working. That makes me think maybe reset's floating. I'm going to try putting my finger on the shield of the USB connector, which is grounded, and then touching this. Yeah, I think our reset pin's floating. That's odd. Did we not connect it to anything? Oh, of course. The reset pin is connected to some of this logic up here, because this one resets when it reaches 7. That is fine. So if I put in the AND gate chip, it should start working. Let's have a go. No, that's because I can't send in a signal now because this output is being driven by the output of the AND gate. That's alright. So I think the next thing to do is probably just to have a look at how to actually implement this breadboard circuit on the circuit board that I've already made, because that seems like it should be an impossible task. But the first thing to do is to break any traces that connect things we no longer want connected. So the best way to do that is to come in with a knife but before we do that, we need to work out which traces we want and which traces we don't want. And for that, I'm going to have a quick look at the schematic. So right now, from the 4020, we are only using the outputs Q9, Q10, and Q14. Luckily, two of those, Q10 and Q14, we already want. So I'm going to leave those traces connected. Because if we imagine our AND gate, which is where all of those signals are going to, is a 5 in per AND gate, we'll just ignore the connection between two internal AND gates, then we can leave the traces that are already in place for Q14 and Q10 as they already go to two of the inputs for our AND gate. It doesn't really matter whether they go in the first AND gate or the second AND gate. However, the trace for Q9 we no longer want, so we have to find which trace that is and kill it. It looks like it goes between pin 12 of the 4020 and pin 1 of the AND gate. So pin 1 of the AND gate is this pin up here and pin 12 of the 4020 is this pin here. Now it looks like this trace is the one we're after. Hopefully you can make it out. It comes out of pin 12 then along, down, up and somewhere up into here. Now what you should really do is check the KiCad file. So I'm going to have a quick look at the board on KiCad. Right, so I can confirm that is the trace we want to kill. So now, it's as simple as getting a knife and running it up and down. Luckily, this little area here doesn't have a ground fill. Hopefully you can see it looks a bit darker than places up here. And that means I don't have to worry about cutting anything else. There's also no traces nearby. So it's almost as if this was planned, it's perfect. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna score it a load of times with my knife. There are probably better types of knife to use for this, but I'm no knife expert, so I'm just using this. Right, I think that went fairly well. The next thing to do is check continuity with the multimeter, just to make sure that we have actually broken it. And this is going from pin 12 to pin 1. Good, no beeping. That means the trace is broken. Now there's one other trace we need to break, which is the one that feeds to the input of the 4026, because at the moment, the 4026 is fed by the very narrow pulse that's coming out of the AND gate. We want it to be fed by one of the outputs of the 4020. 
ah, my camera battery keeps running out. I've got two batteries on the go and I just keep swapping them between camera and charger. I think it does have the ability to use a DC input, so maybe that could be a, a future video, is making a, a mains powered camera so I don't have to worry about it running out. So looking on KiCad, it looks like this diagonal trace is the one that we're interested in. So now we just need to cut that and it will no longer connect the output of the AND gate to the 4026. Then that's another thing where we can add bodge wires onto the back. This one does have the ground plane, but again there's no traces nearby. And if I accidentally slice the ground plane slightly, it shouldn't really matter. Now let's check that one. So it should be from this pin to this pin. And it's not beeping, so that means it's broken. Perfect. Now we've broken the two traces we don't want. We've got three more connections to add between the 4020 and the AND gate and then one connection to add from the AND gate to the 4026. And I have just remembered that we completely forgot about the 4024. So the output from the AND gate wants to go into the 4024 first, then an output from that goes to our 4026. And what that means is we have to cut a few more traces because we want basically a naked 4024 not connected to anything. So I'm going to cut every input and every output that goes to the 4024 because I don't think any of them are useful to us now. So now it's time to add in some bodge wires between the three chips we're interested in. Bodge wires are basically just connections that you solder onto the back. They're a lot easier to make with through hole but you can make bodges with surface mount parts as well. And it's known for using very small wires because they'll do the best job at hiding the fact that you've fucked it up. So you can see this is the wire that I normally use for bodges which is quite thin. You can compare it here to my quite slim oscilloscope probe. The main thing is that it's thin because that also helps if you've got like a fine pin pitch SMD part like let's say you've got to bodge a pin on a QFP package you've got no chance of it's, if it's thick mains wiring for example. You also want solid core because it's just way easier to solder with. So I think probably the first thing I'd do when I want to do bodges like this is write myself a little list of what pins I want to connect to what other pins. And what that's ended up looking like is this mess. So amazingly the three outputs that we're adding for the 4020 connect to the same pins on the AND gate. Pin 1 to pin 1, 4 to 4, 5 to 5. That is so cool and it should end up looking fairly neat because those can just be straight lines. Then the reset output from the AND gate, so that's basically the output of our 5 input AND gate we've made, that's going to pin, that's going from pin 6 on the AND gate to pin 11 on the 4020. Then the clock output goes from pin 13 on the AND gate chip, which is the slowest output of our 4020. That then goes to pin 1, which is the clock input of the 4024. That then halves it a further 3 times to divide by 8. And that is then on pin 9, which we send to pin 1 of the 4026. So I have 6 bodge wires to add in. And I'm just going to go down this list. So an important thing to remember is that the board is upside down, so the pin numbering is going to be flipped. So normally you'd go 1, 2, 3, 4, and you go down and then up here. But because it's flipped over, this is pin 1 and it's going down, along and up. So it's important to not get that wrong. Also the order of the chips has flipped, so now we've got 4020, 4024 and gate inverter. So for the first connection I want to connect pin 1 of the 4020 to pin 1 of the AND gate chip, which should be here. It's also not very good with my spacing, it's quite hard to tell where the chips actually are. Looking at the decoupling capacitors helps, because they're always in the middle of the chips. So we've got 4020, straight line over to the AND gate chip. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to strip one end of my wire, because it's easier to strip them while they've still got some decent length to them. And I just use pliers, but you can use one of those weird things with the holes if you like. And you don't want to strip much, so I've taken about that much relative to the size of the pin poking through. If you strip too much, just to make sure it doesn't short things, solder the part of the wire closest to the insulation and then snip off the excess. So we're going to run from pin 1 there along to pin 1 here, so now I'm going to cut that to the correct length and I'm going to strip the other end. There we go, that fits fairly nicely. The next thing to do is to tin the ends of the wire which will make it a bit easier to solder because what you don't want to be doing is holding the wire, the iron and the solder all at once because you want to save your third hand for special occasions. And basically by tinning what we're doing is we're adding our solder on in advance. 
So there's the solder on one end. The problem with this bodge wire I've got is that it's got it's not high temperature insulation, so it, it bubbles up and looks all horrible if the iron stays on for too long, as it just did. But this is going on the back of my board, so to be honest, I don't really care what it looks like. Right, I've flipped the board over now, and this is pin one of the AND gate chip, which is what I'm going to solder now. So I'm just going to heat it up, and the solder, there should be enough solder on both of the connections for it to just connect like that. It doesn't have to be particularly strong. Then I can just do the same on this side, which you'll probably be able to see a bit better. So right now I'm just pushing it into it. You might have to bend the wire slightly to get the end in. And there we go. That is our first bodge wire. You want to make sure they're flush on the board because they're a lot more noticeable if they're jumping up. Although orange really does stand out on the blue, so luckily I can put all these on the back side of the board. So nobody's going to know, except for the cuts I made. Next I want to connect pin 4 and pin 4, so that's going 1, 2, 3, 4, that's down to here. So that's the one that's level with that capacitor. Again, I want to strip the end of the wire, and then I want to cut it to length. So to do that I'm going to hold it in the place where it's going to go, and then put my snipper there, and now I can just chop it. Now I've got to strip the other end. I'm going to try not tinning the ends this time, and we can learn together whether that's necessary or not for this kind of wire. It's always a good idea too because it's never going to make it any harder. I'm also going to hold the wire with tweezers so hopefully you can see what I'm doing a bit better. I'm going to start on this side. There we go. You can go back to another side afterwards. Then this one I think I'm going to have to hold in place with my finger. There we go. The slight problem with doing that is that because this insulation is very meltable, as I've heated up the wire, it's heated up the insulation and the insulation is squished under my finger. I'm not sure if you'll be able to make it out there, but it looks pretty bad. Now this, w this end isn't very flush, so now I'm going to come in with my finger again and push it down as I reflow the solder. Perfect. That's two of our six bodges. Now I'm going to do the rest and I will be back when they're done. Right, so here all our bodges have been done. Now it's time to test it, so I'm going to start by powering it up from the USB. I've put the chips back in already, and I'm going to use the signal generator for our input. So we've got ground there, clock there, and you can see it's not working, which isn't ideal. So now let's find the problem with our fix to the previous problem. First let's have a look at our clock input. And if I adjust the scale on the scope, there we go, 1 MHz input, that's what it should be, representing our 1 MHz oscillator that's on its way. But for some reason the input to our first clock is just stuck high. So let's try and work out why that is. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at the inputs to my AND gate, because that will probably reveal quite a lot. So this is our first input, let's zoom out a bit on that. And we can see there's definitely something something going on which makes it look like the AND gate's resetting. So now let's have a look at the output of the AND gate. And there we've got those distinct pulses that is exactly what we want. And those even have the right period of 10 milliseconds because we want 80 milliseconds out, but we're going to divide this by 8 in the 4024. So now we're just looking for one of the inputs that will have a similar period to that. So this one is very fast. This one appears to be always high, which is interesting. Then this input has pulses just like the output. This input's higher frequency, and this input's also higher frequency. This input, which is on pin 1, is what I believed to be the lowest frequency input, which is then what I fed to the 4024. Clearly that isn't correct, though, and there's nothing going to the 4024, so I think maybe some of our jumper wires haven't worked properly. Let's have a look at the other inputs to the AND gate which are over here. That's the one we want. See, because that, if I go back to the reset pulse, there's three pulses on the screen. Those pulses are too narrow to trigger the 4024, but this input has three pulses on the screen that are nice and wide, so they will trigger the 4024. So now I'm just going to change that bodge wire, so it's going to go from pin 13 on the AND gate over to pin 1 on the 4024. 
So right now that's this diagonal bodge wire which is coming from, well, it's going to pin 1 on the 4024 and it's coming from, at the moment, somewhere on the 4020, so that's that probably explains why it's not working properly. So that will be my mistake. Let's try and take that off. So to remove a bodge wire, I would just melt it, melt the solder that's holding it on and try and push the wire away from the solder with your iron. So there we go, it's melted and there, I've pulled it away. Once you've got one, you can usually desolder the other end or if you've really not soldered it very well like me, it'll just snap off. So now let's take a look at where this new one wants to go again. It's pin 13, which correlates to this pin here, and then it wants to go to pin 1 on the 4024, which is this pin here. So it's from here to here. Let's see how long that needs to be. Pin 13 up to pin 1. And then I'm going to snip that in place. That's good because also that removes the one overlapping bodge wire which I had because it looks a lot nicer when they're all flush to the board. I have a suspicion that this might not be the only bodge wire that was wrong. Of course, this is all just because of bad planning. If you plan it well, you won't need to make any bodges, and if you plan the bodges well, you won't need to redo the bodges. But I'm a doer, not a planner, so I don't mind redoing something four times if it means I don't have to make a plan. Let's give it a test now then. Still nothing. So let's take a look at what's going on now. First I'm going to look at the output of the AND gate. There we've got our nice reset pulse. Now the input of the 4024, that's good. That's what we want. So now I just have a suspicion that the output of the 4024 is actually not connected properly. So I think it should be this output. Let's take a look at that, see what it's doing. Oh, it's just stuck high. That's interesting. What's our reset pin doing? Oh, we've got oscillations on the reset pin. Yeah, this reset pin doesn't look very happy. Now, I wonder why that is, because it should just be tied to ground. I wonder whether I've damaged its ground connection with my cutting I did. What I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the chip to make sure that's not having any influence on my probing. And now I'm going to pop that in here. Yeah. See it oscillating away. Interesting. I wonder if I've broken a ground plane. Ah, of course, the reset pin of the 4024 used to be also triggered from the output of the AND gate. I cut that, so now the reset pin is indeed floating. So now I need to tie that low with another bodge wire. Woohoo! This one is going to go from the reset pin, which is pin 2, down to ground, which is pin 7. So that will involve bringing this connection down to here. This is the ground terminal of that chip. This is a very short bodge wire, so it'll probably be a bit harder. There we go. I made the mistake of pushing my nail into that one, so the nail has actually pierced the insulation. You probably can't make it out, but it looks very bad. Right, attempt number three. Nope, still nothing. Right. One megahertz in. Output of the AND gate. We've no longer got our pulse. Interesting. Let's check the inputs to the AND gate again. So we've got, there's an input here, which isn't resetting, that's expected now. Then here's an input, that's speedy. Then here's an input, that's the one that we did like, but now it's not getting reset. That's the output of those three ANDed together. Then they want to go with this one, which is always high for some reason and this one which is always low for some reason. So now I'm going to check those outputs on here which should be pins 4 and 5 on the 4020 which again they're doing that same thing stuck high and stuck low even though there's other outputs of the 4020 which are oscillating so that makes me think they're being pulled high or pulled low by something else probably a dodgy connection from me so let's flip it over and take a look at those connections which are these two running along here. There we've got nothing. 
Now the only things I've changed is I've added this one that comes along the top of them. But that might be upsetting it somehow. So I'm going to quickly pop one end of that off. Oh, there we go. Now you can really see how the insulation's bad. See how it's just, the insulation's just completely come off that wire. So now that bodge has come off, unfortunately. Let's check what we've got now. We've got one of the outputs back, the other one's still pulled higher by something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to prise my bodge wire up from the board. There we go. So did you see when it was down on the board? Oh, there we go. This is the problem with shit bodge wire, is that the insulation can melt and then it can short out on other pins. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to redo this bodge wire. This one seems like it should be alright now. And then I'm going to redo that one on top. Right, that's the first bodge wire redone. And that's the second bodge wire done, which at the moment is lifted up a bit just to make sure there's no, no funny business going on. Let's try again. Oh, that's a good sign, it's counting. Oh, maybe it wasn't a good sign. Let's check the output of the AND gate. Nothing. Let's check the inputs to the AND gate. That's That one's stuck low. That one's working, that one's working, working. So let's just check which one's stuck low. It's the lowest one. So if I flip that over again, that's the one we didn't redo, so I'm going to redo that one as well. Right, there we go. Let's try that one. Uh, what now? Clock output has the pulses. Input to the 4024 is correct. Output of the 4024 is stuck high because the reset pin of the 4024 is low, which it should be. Hmm. There's a chance that this reset pin might be active low, so what I'm going to do, because I can't be bothered to desolder my bodge and put it back in, is I've taken out the 4024, and I'm going to bend the reset pin up so that I can just try connecting it to 5 volts. Right, I'm afraid my SD card filled up and I didn't notice, so I'm afraid we've just lost a bit of footage. But it's all working now, and I can quickly go through the final things that I did. So we saw just there that the reset pin of the 4024, even when I connected it high, wasn't resolving the issue, and that's because the output of it was being pulled high because I had connected, basically one of my bodge wires was wrong, so it was connecting that output pin to 5 volts. So now the output pin is correctly connected to pin 1 of the 4026, and I think it's counting up at the right speed. It might, it does actually look quite slow, so this, this might not be the right speed. So let's have a look at the input frequency of this 4026, just to make sure that's correct. If I adjust the scale on the scope so that we can see the period, 160 milliseconds. So that's really weird, because that means the maths that I did on paper was correct. But then when I built the breadboard circuit, I must have done something wrong that meant I had to divide by 8. But it should be 4, just like my maths said. So I'm going to change that bodge so that it connects this to the divide by 4 output of the 4024 instead of the divide by 8. Then we should be done. Right, I've now got that bodge sorted. So let's plug it in and see what happens. With an 80 millisecond period, the second digit should count up a little bit faster than once a second. Now that looks very promising. I'll check the input to the first 4026. There's our 83 millisecond period. Finally, everything's working. Perfect. What I'm going to do as a test is I'm going to leave this running until my oscillator arrives, which could be a few days, and see how well it keeps the time. And if it doesn't, if it's a little bit off, it doesn't matter because I'm still using my function generator. Not a very precise crystal oscillator. Whoa ho ho, hold your horses. One thing we haven't checked, well, I have just checked and it doesn't work, is the resetting on 7 of the most significant digit. So, to test that, what I did is I got the output from the function generator, which is 1 megahertz, and got rid of the division circuitry so I could just run everything very fast. And you'll see, it shouldn't say 7, it should go back to 0 when it, when it reaches 7. But it's not doing that. 
So what I've done is I've taken out the 4024 so that I can connect my input signal into there. And now I'm going to do a little bit of probing on this 4026 and the AND gate and the inverter to try and work out what's going on. Because this is running at quite a low frequency, I'm going to go for roll mode on the oscilloscope. And now let's take a look at a few different things. So the first thing I'm going to check is the reset pin, which should be this one. And we can see that's just sitting at, sitting at ground potential. So next, let's have a look at the AND gate. So the AND gate that I'm using within the AND gate chip is the bottom right one. So that has three inputs and an output. That's our output, which again is just connected to ground. Then we've got one input, which is at two volts for some reason. I think that's because it's one of the outputs of the 4026, which is being pulled down by the display. So that could be that could be a reason why the AND gate's not liking it. Let's look at the other two inputs. This one is being switched, so this is another input from the 4026, but this one's got the full 5 volt potential. And then the final one, this should be the one that's tied high. Yes. So I think the reason why the AND gate isn't outputting anything is because the logic level of this input is only at 2 volts. And that's because this output directly drives one of the segments. So that's why it's being pulled down. So this is a bit of a tricky one to solve. Right, to cut a long story short, I've come up with a system that will fix this. So basically, because the logic level coming out is too low, what I'm doing is I'm bringing it along to this circuit, which I'm going to try and bodge onto the back, which is just a little transistor. And this is like an inverting amplifier, so it's an N-channel low side switch that pulls down a pull-up. And I think I found that this output actually works correctly. I was just, I did just get to the point where I was just trying pins. There, so you can see it resets, it never reaches 7, which is exactly what we want. So that is taking, if you look at the scope screen, that is taking this low signal, low level signal, which only reaches 2 volts, that's then going to the base of this transistor which turns on and pulls down this pull-up which then basically amplifies it while inverting it up to a 5 volt signal. I can then feed that in. So what I need to do for that bodge is I need a long wire coming up from the output that I've found works of this 4026 going through a resistor to the base of an NPN transistor which is then pulling down a pull-up which amplifies my signal up to 5 volts and inverts it and that then goes to this reset input. I'm going to see if I can find an N-channel MOSFET because then I wouldn't need the base resistor. This is the level of bodge you don't want to be doing in your projects because this is beyond just changing connections, this is actually adding circuitry which is really horrible. But it does work and that will make everything work so I'm going to give it a go. There we go, all sorted. I think this has got to be the most bodge-tastic board I have ever made. Here we've got our 1 MHz input to the first 4026, so these ones are too fast to see, just like before. But take a look at this. Wow. Bodge City. So now, the newest bodge, we've got this big long run coming up here. Then a resistor, I couldn't find a MOSFET, so then it goes through a resistor to the base of the NPN transistor, whose emitter goes to the negative pin of this chip, the pull-up is connected to the positive pin of this chip, and the collector connects to the pin we care about. So it almost looks quite cool because it's just so dense. There you go, you can get a proper picture of it. I think I might use this as the thumbnail just to say how to do a good bodge. I don't know, it's, oh, I don't think there's such thing as a good bodge, but if there is one, I think this is it. Right, it's been a few days and the oscillator's arrived, so let's have a look. Here we go. Ooh. So I'm just going to get straight to it and solder it in. And there we go, all finished, and it actually works. Something quite cool I've noticed is that if I power it on, you can see it here counting up, and if I press the reset button, it'll go back to zero. But this input capacitor that I have is actually so big that if I 
unplug the power, the display goes off as expected. But then when I plug it back in, it's actually remembered what number it was on, which is really weird. And I think that's because the power, the LEDs use quite a lot of current, so they'll immediately draw the capacitor voltage below their turn on voltage. And that's probably too low for the oscillator to keep oscillating. But these 4026s use a tiny amount of current and they're still able to store their value. So if you left it for a little while, it would probably discharge, but it's quite cool that if I had to like quickly unplug it to change some cable routing or something like that, it could probably last maybe like 30 seconds without being plugged in, which is quite cool. Although obviously then the value would be offset, so then you'd be a few seconds out. Right, well sadly that's everything for this project, so thank you to everybody that's been watching and giving me likes in these videos, and until next time, goodbye!